Thank you, Ana Luisa, for your kind and generous introduction. Muy buenos días, señoras y señores. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure that I stand before you today and honored as being the first Mexican-American AILA president in AILA's 69 years of existence. I first want to take the time to thank my beautiful wife, Rosy, and my four equally beautiful children, Dariana, Joshua, Jacob, and Danny. Without their permission, their understanding, and sacrifice, I would not be here before you today. Thank you for putting up with my commitments. AILA has come a long way since its founding on October 14, 1946 by 19 immigration attorneys in Manhattan, New York. Our organization is now about 14,000 members strong with 39 chapters in the United States and three abroad, and it continues to grow. Our membership is as diverse as the people we represent. My journey to this podium has been no different than the journey taken by many of our clients and immigrant families. I was born in Mexicali, Baja California, Mexico. And despite many years of work, I have not been able to work off those cheeks. I think they're here to stay. My parents, Jorge Nieblas and Irma Pradis, immigrated to the United States in February 1972. They, like many other families seeking a better life, were the original dreamers. For their love, wisdom, support, and courage to dream beyond the physical barriers of the border fence, I thank them with all my being. Los quiero mucho. I was two years old when we settled across La Línea, or the border, in Calexico, California, a small town along the U.S.-Mexico-California border, along with my four siblings, Jorge, Karina, Danitza, and Noé. Immigrant issues were part of our experience and our reality. The international border was only eight blocks from my home. The border patrol station was only two blocks from my home. My next door neighbor was a border patrol agent, and across the street lived a high-ranking member of the Drug Enforcement Agency. My upbringing exposed me to the good and bad of the immigrant experience along the U.S. southern western border of the United States. I vividly remember in February 1979, while going to the grocery store with my mother, the street leading to the store was blocked. There was a demonstration and a march. We were at a standstill. I got on top of my car so we could see what was going on. I noticed farm workers marching down Imperial Avenue, carrying a coffin above their heads. Cesar Chavez says, United Farm Workers led the march to El Hoyo, as it was called, an area on 2nd Street near the U.S.-Mexico border where the farm workers gathered to get jobs and where the UFW had its headquarters. I later discovered a farm worker named Rufino Contreras had been shot multiple times and killed by a foreman at the Saicon Ranch where he had worked for for seven years because he was picketing and striking for better wages and treatment, along with United Farm Workers. As a young child, I had no clue about what was going on. I had many questions. I vividly asked my mother, and remember, I asked her, what are they asking for? What do they want? My mother, 
with the strength she always displayed to me, said, Mijo, like us and your uncles, they just want a better life in this country. I immediately understood her words, as many of my family work in the fields of the Imperial and Coachella Valleys, following the seasonal crops, including for a time, my father. This was my introduction to the treatment of farm workers and immigrants in the United States. You see, in our world, it is a sign of pride, family values, and even manhood to be able to work in the fields and provide for your family. We understood it was hard and difficult work. I remember my father took my brother to pick watermelons. I must have been 10 or 11 years old, and my brother was only two years older than I. I begged my father to take me to the fields to work because I wanted to prove to him that I could handle it and that I was a man. He said I was too young. I wouldn't be able to make it. I felt like a failure. I cried all day until they came back that night. I just wanted to contribute to the family household. I guess it wasn't meant to be for me. This was our experience along the U.S.-Mexico border. This was our reality and continues to be the reality for many. Many of my farm work, many of my family members continue to proudly work the lands and the fields up and down California and Arizona. That is why you will never hear me say that agricultural work is low-skilled employment. This, is, this work is as high-skilled as any computer programmer or chemist. If you believe it is low-skilled, let my tío Alfredo take you to work one day and see if you have the high skills needed to survive. We must continue to evaluate the terms and concepts we apply to essential workers in this country. Our upbringing included the challenges faced by many border residents. We experienced the entry of commerce, trade across our border. We experienced the long lines at the port of entry when we visited family across the border, including the regular secondary inspection stops that unfortunately we became accustomed to. We experienced the now common phrase, driving while brown. Anywhere you drove, jogged, fished, rode your bicycle outside city limits, or adventured in the beloved nature walks, you had to expect the Border Patrol to stop you after you triggered the hidden sensors and inquire about your legal status in the United States. This continues to be the reality for border communities. While working at a summer job during high school, I found myself in the middle of an INS raid or as they are now called, enforcement actions. I worked at El Succedo shop. I rode my bicycle to work every day. That particular morning, as I approached the shop, I saw men with walkie-talkies kneeling at the corner of the street. I figured it had to do with some type of police action, and I didn't want to get in the middle of it. They saw me, and I saw them. I decided to enter the shop through the back to avoid interrupting whatever these individuals had going on. As I started working in front of the store, I saw about 10 men rush into the store and yell, INS, this is a raid. Yes, it's true, like a stereotypical movie. It was obvious it was La Migra. I immediately saw three elderly seamstresses run into the dressing rooms. The agents didn't allow them to get too far. They were arrested. One of the male workers exited through the back and hid in the tire store next door. None of the agents asked me for any documents. They didn't speak to me. I was shocked and baffled at what I was seeing, and I absorbed every moment of it. It was imprinted in my memory forever. Three elderly women were handcuffed and taken away. I didn't say anything. I remained quiet. I wondered whether they had surveilled me and followed me to my home. Why wasn't I arrested? Why did they not cover the back door? I had many questions. The funny thing about this experience 
was the three women were back at work in two days. It made no sense, but this was our reality. This experience sparked my interest in the media and telling stories. I worked my way to becoming the editor of my high school newspaper. Like many of our clients that we represent, we were just trying to survive and contribute as much as we could. I continued to learn the importance of advocacy in college. While at the beautiful University of California at San Diego, at La Jolla, I helped with a great boycott with the United Farm Workers. I eventually met Cesar Chavez at UCSD two years before his death. I also became a student leader and took on various leadership positions. While at UCSD, I can encountered a phrase I have carried with me for many years. As I entered the classroom of my political science class, the professor had a phrase written in large, bold letters across a 30-foot chalkboard, and it read, Quis quistoriet, ipsos quistores. It is the Latin phrase used by the Roman poet Juvenal, roughly meaning, who guards the guardians themselves? Juvenal was referring to marital fidelity. The phrase is more generally used to refer to the problem of controlling the actions of persons in positions of power, an issue carried and discussed by Plato in the Republic. I have carried this phrase with me throughout the years, applying it in different contexts. Whether it was litigating affirmance without opinion decisions of the Board of Immigration Appeals to the Court of Appeals, or working on liaison committees to hold our agencies accountable when they make irrational decisions in our cases, or lobbying Congress for fair and reasonable immigration laws and policy, this phrase continues to remind me why I decided, like most of you, to defend a vulnerable and voiceless immigrant community. To me, defending the immigrant community is defending my own family. Whether to support our American businesses in growing our economy with immigrant talent or preventing the disintegration of American families by preventing family separation, holding our government accountable when it comes to the implementation of our immigration laws is right and just. Someone gave me the opportunity to come to this country. I want to make sure that same opportunity remains for other immigrants seeking the same dream. It is with this background that I decided to join AILA in 1997. I was employed with my compadre, Enrique Arevalo, when a coworker, the now Honorable Christine Stansel immigration judge, introduced me to AILA. Immediately, I noticed the lack of diversity in the leadership. There were not many members that looked like me. AILA's advocacy director at the time, Judy Golub, took an interest in our media advocacy efforts. Enrique and I decided to take our weekly Spanish radio show to the AILA conferences. We interviewed AILA leaders and discussed the issues of the day. More importantly, we forced our AILA leaders to speak Spanish. It became clear that AILA's strength as a premier bar association of immigration attorneys and professors would thrive with greater diversity. Without this foresight and the wisdom of Judy Golub, this breakthrough might have taken longer. Thank you, Judy. My presence here today is also due to the hard work of three AILA visionaries. La Jefa, Deborah Natkin, the wise man, Daryl Buffenstein, and the muscle, Alan Kay, as well as other Southern California members, Mary Mucha, Alan Maoli, Las Madrinas, Enrique Arevalo, Naomi Ramirez, and many others from Southern California. Thank you all for believing in a new era for Ela. Ultimately, I want to thank you, the membership, for believing in the strength of diversity. We become stronger as an association 
when we use the diverse experiences of our members in our work. ALA's strength is in our differences. That's what diversity can bring to us. ALA doesn't require gender or ethnicity to be reported when you join the association. So I look for any available numbers. This is not a total picture, but most of the members do self-report. So here's what we know from you. The majority of our members are women. Thank you for showing us the way. Our members come from practices large and small. Nearly 32% per report being a solo practitioner, while about the same percentage also report being part of a small law firm. We have members in medium and large law firms, in in-house corporate counsel, legal and nonprofits, law school faculty, and the, seem, and the list seems to go on forever and ever. Folks, that's diversity. Of the nearly 10,000 ALA members who self-report ethnicity, about 44% are Caucasian. Nearly 22% are Hispanic or Latino. 13% are Asian Pacific Islanders. And again, the list goes on. We gain from those diverse experiences. We learn from each other. And I'm glad that I have seen that diversity grow over the years. But we need more. With the assistance of ALA staff person Teresa Waters, we will create a diversity and inclusion initiative. As we plan our work and mentor and groom future leaders, seek involvement from members, whether it be at the Board of Governors, chapters, committees, authors, speakers, pro bono efforts, we have to ask ourselves, what, if anything, can we do to expand diversity and inclusion within our own organization? How can we build a culture of a nation of immigrants that resonates through ALA, one which truly represents diversity, differences in nearly everything that we do. I hope I can count on your participation in this initiative. Our organization consists of extraordinary individuals with unique talents and hearts of gold. We carry the vision of the founders of ALA, but we face different challenges in an ever-changing world of immigration. Our members face challenges in adjudications before the agencies. Liaison between AILA and the Department of Homeland Security have never been more important. However, we have to recognize that some approaches will work and others will not. To that end, with the assistance of AILA's liaison director, we have created a liaison task force that will seek to address what is AILA's mission and goals for liaison. Should we change the way we approach our liaison efforts and engage with the agencies? Are we talking to the right government officials? How can we best serve the liaison-related needs of our members? How can we best utilize those resources and limited resources? We intend to revisit our liaison approach and get answers to improve our liaison efforts with the agencies and provide a better service to our members. In addition, racial profiling and excessive fatal use of force does not just happen in the streets of Baltimore, Ferguson, or other U.S. urban cities. We have also seen it along the border regions. For years, policing concerns have arisen with the United States Border Patrol. Some articles have called them a rogue agency whether racial profiling is used to justify the bad treatment of legal visa holders as they enter our country, or used to unjustly stop and harass many individuals while they travel within 100 miles from any U.S. border, these acts must be challenged and brought to an end. The shootings and killings of immigrants along the U.S.-Mexico border have raised serious concerns about Border Patrol policies. Guns versus rock throwing only leads to the loss of human lives. I would like to add to the desperate chants we hear daily by saying, immigrant lives matter. Every person is Every life and person is, pre is precious. 
while many police agencies around the country have adopted the use of body cameras on their agents, the Border Patrol is taking the long road to the solution, implementing study after study, but not deploying the cameras, ending the dreaded use of the yeleras, or the practice of detaining immigrants in freezing rooms that mimic ice boxes. We will continue to work with our community-based partners to address these concerns. To this end, this year, we have expanded our Customs and Border Protection Liaison Committee to include half of its members to address Border Patrol abuse issues in the northern and southern borders. We will continue also to focus on the unauthorized practice of law, as we have for the past two decades. Attention will be focused on the culprits of the fraud, notarios, the un unscrupulous consultants, the unlicensed charlatans, the unauthorized practice of law continues to destroy immigrant communities. Our interest in this battle is simple. We want applicants to have the correct legal advice, the best opportunity to legalize their status in the United States for the sake of their families and their employers. Our message to the public will continue to be, you have built a life here. It's time to build your future map out a path with an immigration lawyer. New technologies have also opened the door to online fraud via the internet. The threats of the net tarios is real. Online scams that make lofty promises to immigrant applicants will continue to grow if they are not confronted and addressed. We need to look at the present and future state of non-lawyer practitioners accredited representatives, limited licensed technicians, consultants, and notarios. We need to analyze the existing and emerging technologies in the practice of law. Can we make legal services better? More importantly, we need to ask the critical question, do the rules of professional conduct impede innovation? What changes would help? To find our way through this morass, AILA's future of Immigration Law Practice Task Force will be addressing these issues this coming year. After all, we are the experts in this area. We study the law, we teach the law, we know the law, we see how the law is applied every day, and we see its impact. We are the guides inside the maze, the key masters to the labyrinth. This experience was never clearer to me than when I represented my uncle before CIS. My tío Checo, or my uncle, could not pass his naturalization exam. He called me for help because his son was graduating from high school and didn't have any documents. Living along the U.S.-Mexico border, this is not so uncommon. As a young attorney, I decided to take a journey with him to explore our roots. As is the case with many Mexican families, and due to our specific geographical history with the United States, both of my grandmothers were born in the United States. This meant that my uncle's mother, or my grandmother, was also born in the United States. Armed with my Kurtzman and Bob Maltino's naturalization chart, I mastered the concept of acquisition of citizenship. I searched Los Angeles County for the proof that my gr grandmother had resided for the required time in the United States after her birth and after the age of 14. We filed an N-600. My aunts kept arguing with my uncle, you have to do your part. You have to study your naturalization questions. I informed him they're wrong. You're not supposed to do that. My uncle was confused. At the interview, the CIS officer only asked one question. Why didn't he file the N-600 before? I proudly answered, because he didn't have an attorney in the family that understood the concept of acquisition of citizenship. My uncle's journey was as much my journey as it was his. And yes, for those who are wondering, yes, I did do the case pro bono. <laughs> I didn't have a choice. This meant that my mother acquired citizenship from my grandmother, although we did it the long way in 1972, as well as the rest of my six aunts, five uncles, 
and there are hundreds of kids or my cousins. I mean, what can I say? We're a large family. We're Mexican. I mean, United States citizens. My young nieces and nephews recently reminded me of the true meaning of family at La Remu. After creating a path lined with white rocks leading to a small mount made for my mother and father, they named it Trail to Mount Ohana. They reminded me Ohana means family, and familia means nobody gets left behind or forgotten. Family is the centerpiece of my practice. I'm not alone in that. According to the AILA database, over 8,600 members select family immigration as an area of expertise. In immigration law, especially with so many solo practitioners, it's no surprise that more than half of the members also choose business immigration as an area of expertise. You can be good at, one, at more than one area of immigration law. At least that's what I like to believe. Today, we have a very special group of people with us today. They have traveled from Honduras to the United States at great peril to their lives. They've traveled in search of a better life for their families and fled the persecution in their countries. Along the way, they have suffered grave accidents while riding La Bestia, or the Beast. Some have lost limbs. They have traveled on a long caravan from city to city to make their stories known. They are here to remind us of the struggles and dangers faced by asylum seekers and the unjust policies applied to them by our government. Please help me and welcome Amaredis, the Caravan of the Mutilated, La Caravana de los Mutilados, señores. Thank you for your brave journey and your important message. Muchas gracias por su mensaje, su esfuerzo, dedicación y corazón. Gracias. One area of immigration law that I put to practice in this past year was asylum. I learned in the trenches at a family detention center that misguided government policies can cause irrever irrever irreversible damage on mothers and children. The experience changed my life. This leads me to another focus of my efforts this coming year, continue the push to end family detention. <laughs> the influx of asylum seekers and refugees presenting themselves for arrest at our southern border last summer revealed the ugliness of our government policies. In an effort to send a strong message to Central American countries to keep their families at home, our government began to detain helpless mothers and their children. These unconscionable actions only served to rally the brave-hearted spirits of our own AILA warriors. Always knowing the potential of our organization and its members, I was never as proud to be an AILA member than when I saw the reaction of our members to this ongoing injustice and legal crisis. Week after week, month after month, AILA members left their practices and families behind and journeyed to the family prison located in the middle of nowhere, Artesia, New Mexico, to face the unjust deeds of our government head on. An unprecedented movement started that continues today. Our members' pro bono's efforts caused Artesia to collapse and close down. The fight continues today. The fight continues today in the family prisons located in Dilly, Texas, Carnes, Texas, and Berks County, Pennsylvania. Quis custodiet, ipsos custodis. Who guards the guardians? If you volunteered or are volunteering to represent families in Artesia, Dilly or Carnes or Burks, please stand up right now.
You need to be recognized for your dedication, your commitment, your selflessness, your rage, and most important, your love for our fellow human beings. Thank you very much. Thanks to my Southern California chapter, I had the opportunity to take a tour of duty at the family prison site in Artesia, New Mexico. What I saw and what I experienced has shaken me to my core. Women of all ages locked up with their children and infants under the guise of national security. I saw small children losing weight because they were not used to the frozen food given to them and desperate mothers forcing their babies to eat despite their loud cries. I witnessed the story of a sick infant that was given the wrong dosage of medicine by the camp doctors. Any time that I walked from trailer to trailer, I had to be escorted by an ICE agent, even when I had to use a porta potty. More shocking was seeing my seeing mothers and their children escorted by men 10 times their size from trailer, trailer to trailer. The time that I spent with the fellow ELA members in the trenches was life-changing. I can tell you that the only aliens that I saw were located, located 41 miles north of Artesia in Roswell, New Mexico. Them folks were green, had big heads, and wore shiny outfits. After days of pro bono work, and days away from my family, a young girl approached me after representing her mother and her brother in a credible fear determination. She reminded me of my eight-year-old daughter, same skin tone, same hair, same skinny body. She walked directly towards me after the interview and without saying a word, handed me a drawing that she had been working on. It was a beautiful, colorful house with a chimney and a big yellow sun shining in the sky. I was stunned, immobilized. This is her way of expressing yearning to be free. And these kids are national security threats, I wondered. This is her way of thanking me. This is all she had to express her gratitude. It's worth a million dollars. It's no wonder Satsuki Ina, Professor Emeritus at the California State University, Sacramento, called family prisons American internment camps. Professor Ina was born in a Japanese-American prison camp during World War II. In a recent article, she correctly states, I know an American internment camp when I see one. The New York Times editorial board has called family prisons immoral. The UN Human Rights Council called upon the U.S. to halt the detention of immigrant families and children. 136 congressional representatives have also called upon the Obama administration to end family detention. 33 senators also stated family detention is not consistent with our moral values and historic commitment to provide safe and humane refuge to those fleeing persecution. Psychologists and therapists have interviewed families in these prisons and concluded that the children there are facing some of the most adverse childhood conditions of any children I have ever interviewed or evaluated, said Dr. Luis Sayas, Dean of Social Work at the University of Texas. Professor Ina, a private psychotherapist wrote, prison is no place for a child and locking up children is inherently traumatic. Children are particularly susceptible to developing symptoms of trauma that persists long after the threat is removed. These often include hypervigilance, uncontrollable bouts of crying, 
sleep disturbance, and depressed mood. The damage and the trauma to these mothers and children in these family prisons are as equally destructive as the legal procedures applied by the Department of Homeland Security and the courts from systematic abuse of the credible fear and reasonable fear procedures towards these mothers by DHS to the irrational high bonds am amounts set by the immigration judges to the alternately dismissive and intimidating attitudes of ICE officers and detention center employees towards volunteers and attorneys. The family detention scheme is a stain to our country's history and goes against our most fundamental values as a nation. <laughs> to this end, we have created a family detention task force to address these important issues. Despite your positive steps on immigration reform, this must be said. Shame on you, Mr. President, for detaining helpless mothers and children. Shame on you to all the personnel who implement these immoral directives. <laughs> History will judge our nation's actions against these persecuted refugees. We must end family detention now. Quis custodiet ipsos custodis. Who guards the guardians? In the meantime, ALA volunteer warriors with our partners and our complete support will continue to fight the family detention apparatus toe-to-toe -to -toe face-to-face in the family prisons and makeshift immigration courts to ensure many of these families do not go quietly into the night. Between June 2014 and April 2015, ICE booked in over 4,800 families, mothers and children, into these family prisons. As a result of the ALA Pro Bono Project, positive credible fear determinations have increased dramatically due to our involvement. In July 2014, the credible fear determination was only 40%. By October 2014, it rose to 87%. From January to March 2015, the rates are now up to 88%. Nationwide, it stands at 70. This is clear evidence of our high impact in a short amount of time in Artesia. Additionally, from the Artesia caseload, our volunteers have won 17 out of 22 asylum merits hearings. In Dili, our latest count had eight asylum or withholding wins with no losses. This proves what we have been asserting all along. These women and children are refugees, not unlawful entrants. Our work has resulted in the in hundreds of women and children being bonded out and given an opportunity to pursue their immigration cases meaningfully. Last summer, we saw bonds regularly set at $30,000. Now we see routinely bonds of $1,500, $2,500, and in some cases, conditional parole or no bond. This is something we, we would have never have seen without our volunteers' intervention but the federal government keeps shoving more mothers and children into these facilities. 1,800 women and children are held in Dili at last count, with more to come. Our latest numbers indicate the project is seeing 75 to 110 women daily, with 200 women on the waiting list to see attorneys. Since February 22nd, we have had 125 individuals volunteer in Dili, including attorneys, law students, paralegals, and interpreters. This is truly a community effort. Proudly, our rough calculations from our work in Artesia indicates volunteers on the ground, or the OTGs, provided more than 20,000 hours of pro bono service in the short time the facility was open. 20,000 hours of pro bono service. Assuming a billable hour of $250, ALA volunteers 
have provided over $5 million worth of pro bono services. $5 million, ladies and gentlemen. As our pro bono, pro bono staff director, Susan Timmons stated, to me, this is nothing short of amazing. However, this is not over. The need for your participation in these efforts exists now more than ever. This is to continue, if this is continued to succeed, we will need your involvement in any capacity. So I challenge each and every one of you, including my XCOM colleagues, to volunteer your time, take the tour of duty, donate money, and help end family detention. Take the oath adopted by many of us in Artesia, the desire to serve, the courage to act, the ability to perform. This was a saying adopted by the Artesia Bulldog football team and printed on their shirts sold all over town and a rallying cry by the Ala volunteers. As Cesar Chavez said, the end of all education should surely be service to others. And of course, we cannot forget we must remain vigilant to correct the broken immigration system in which 11 million aspiring Americans toil in the shadows, unable to untangle themselves from the grip of an antiquated immigration law. Unfortunately, we have a Congress that refuses to do its job and send a president a common sense bill that will bring America's immigration policy into the 21st century a policy that will keep our borders secure, our families safe and together, and maintain America's global economic competitiveness. Until Congress steps up, the President has used his lawful, yes, lawful, and soundly constitutional executive authority to offer a brief deportation reprieve to an estimated five million dreamers or undocumented parents. We have all seen the smile of the dreamer who has just learned she can go to college, or the, rele the relief in the eye of the DACA recipient from Arizona who, thanks to our court, can now apply for a driver's license. But I need not remind you that as we sit here today, the President's executive action on immigration remains stalled in the courts the target of a brazenly political lawsuit by, brought by Republican governors and the attorney generals from 26 states. Today, I hope you will join me in calling upon those attacking DAPA and DACA expansion to dismiss their frivolous lawsuit against the American families and on Congress to finally pass comprehensive, common sense immigration reform with an earned pathway to legalization residents, and citizenship for all aspiring Americans. <laughs> to make these goals a reality, AILA needs you. I welcome your input and assistance this coming year. Working together only makes us stronger. Working through our differences only makes us more productive. Having suspicious minds about the organization only leads us to an Elvis song. Now, the hard work begins. The words are over. The actions count. Get your boarding passes ready. Strap on them seatbelts. Let's go to work. Let's get it on. Thank you very much. Si se puede, si se pudo, y si se podrá. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias.